guys. Um, so I know I don't do like sit down and talk videos very often. Um, I actually find it quite hard to think of things to sit down and talk about. So um, after you've watched this, if you if there's anything you want me to talk about in a video like this, just put a comment down below um, and I'll check through the suggestions. Um, so this one's going to be about my diagnosis, which is borderline personality disorder. Um, and I wanted to do this video because I think that people have a better understanding of the things I do or the things I say um, if they understand my diagnosis a bit better. Um, and as well, I think that other people who might have this diagnosis can sort of feel like they're not alone. There is others that feel like you do. Um, and hopefully to see how far in recovery I've come, it'll give people some hope as well if they're not so far. Um, and as well, just in case um, there is people out there and they recognize some of the symptoms or the feelings and things, then you can sort of go and seek help um, or if it's someone that you love, get them help. So, I was going to start off with um, how I was diagnosed. And here's Dolly. <laughs> um, so yeah, when my symptoms first started to sort of properly exhibit themselves, I guess, um, I was 18 years old and so mental health professionals wanted to avoid giving me such a diagnosis at that young an age. Um, and I know that there is sort of adolescents and things who are diagnosed with that, but I think that um, everything came on so suddenly. It was literally like all of a sudden they hear a voice and then within 10 days, right, I'm overdosed and I want to take my life. So I think as well they needed to get like a proper sort of um, assessment on um, my symptoms and things and to get a better understanding because at first um, they did think it was psychosis um, so I was kept on a psychiatric intensive care unit for five months to rule that out. So once it was ruled out um, I noticed on a discharge summary once from a psychiatric hospital that my preliminary diagnosis was borderline personality disorder. No one had ever sort of voiced this to me or said that was what they were sort of thinking was wrong with me. Um, and I'd never heard of it before. And then I can remember um, when I was, I'd run away and overdosed to Cumbria and I was um, sectioned by the police under their holding powers um, and I got assessed under the Mental Health Act at the time and this psychiatrist sort of asked about my diagnosis and I said they think it's BPD but they're not sort of saying it concrete so he said I want to run through these questions and at the time I had no idea what he was on about but he asked me a question for sort of each symptom and then at the end of it, he said, you need at least five out of nine to be diagnosed and that I had all nine. Um, and then I remember sort of coming home from that and saying to um, my community team, like, look, he said that I definitely have it. Like, what's it gonna take to actually be diagnosed? And they just weren't keen. And I guess as well, um, there was, there was still and there probably is still like a lot of things with professionals around this diagnosis. There's some professionals who won't even class it as a diagnosis, like regardless of what book sits in or anything. Um, and at the time I was basically told that being diagnosed with BPD was being given a death sentence basically. Um, it does have a high mortality rate. Um, I know anorexia is sort of the highest, um, but yeah, it is quite likely that those with BPD will end up 
killing themselves or in hospital for a very long time but that shouldn't um it's very hard and at the time when I learnt that I was just like what chance have I got and I was sort of so determined on things and hurting myself but I want people to see that you know that's what I used to think when I was diagnosed with it and if that's what you're thinking then there is hope because I was there I felt like that and now I'm getting better um I think as well another reason um for me being diagnosed was when they realized that all the help I was being offered in the community just wasn't working um they tried sort of sectioning me and putting me in hospital for long periods of time to try and break the cycle of the overdosing which was sort of the I guess in their eyes like the most dangerous of my symptoms um and it just wouldn't work I'd either run away from the hospital and overdose or as soon as I got out I'd overdose again um, so then they just tried like really little brief admissions and that didn't work. Um, I had psychology and I think when I began psychology with a trained um, dialectical behaviour therapist that was sort of my most stable period from 2009 until 2011 or something. Um, and even that was only for a few months. So I think um, my diagnosis being sort of cemented, is that the right word, cemented? My diagnosis being made more concrete um, was largely to do with getting me the right kind of help that I needed um, because the specialist units for personality disorders, you've obviously got to have that diagnosis. And that was the help I needed. That was the help that everyone thought would make me better. So I had to have that diagnosis in order to access them services. Um, so I think the diagnosis was probably put on, attached to my name after maybe two years of being in and out of services. Um, and then I just wanted to go through with you about the symptoms. Um, I think the diagnosis criteria has changed since I was diagnosed um, but when I was it was nine possible symptoms and you have to have at least five to be diagnosed and like I said earlier I got told I had all nine so um, the first one was mood changes um, and I found that I could, at first, it was mainly just really down, like low times, like wanting to self harm, wanting to die, feeling completely hopeless, um, being anxious and stressed. And it wasn't until sort of a little while later that I started having the highs as well. Um, and it was, it was so tiring, like, I mean, it still is, when I have the highs and lows, I still have them. Um, I just manage them better, but it was so tiring at the time, and, you know, people don't realise, like, it's literally, I could wake up in the morning and be so happy and positive, and loving my life, and then by the evening, I was overdosing and in hospital. And it was just so tiring to go from one to the other and back again and not even sort of lasting it that long. And then as well, you would act upon how you were feeling. So I would self-harm or overdose when I was feeling low and then I'd be feeling high again. And I'd be like, oh, why did I do that? Like now I've got to deal with the consequences of that and I'm feeling much happier. Um. And then the same way, you know, when I was happy, I'd make decisions, I'd take opportunities. And then when I was feeling low, I'd be like, oh, why have I agreed to do this? I'm not ready for it. I can't be bothered. I don't want to. Um, 
So with the mood changes, I think um, I've learned over time to sit with my emotions because before I was in the long term hospital, I think um, as soon as I felt down, I'd go off and overdose. So as soon as it happened, I was so scared of sitting with that emotion and feeling how down I was and talking it through and helping, getting help to like move through it safely because I would just go off an overdose. So I've learnt to do that now. Um, and I think that's helped a lot. I can manage my low points a lot more safely now. Um, my highs as well, I've sort of developed the thinking that um, to make the most of the highs because I know they don't last and I know the lows will come back. So I just like to make the most of them because at least then if I have a down day and I just want to stay in bed, I won't be thinking, oh, I, I could have done this a few weeks ago, I could have done that the other day. So I try and take all, all the opportunities I can while I feel up to them and while I'm sort of excited for them. Um, I do have medication that helps with my mood um, to stabilise it a bit more. My antipsychotic helps to stabilise moods and I'm also on a mood stabiliser as well so obviously that helps. Um, but once again, you know, medications like not the answer and it's not like a long term you know way to solve something as well which is why I've still um I had to learn coping strategies beyond medication um I kind of felt like the medication put me in a better position to learn to deal with things more safely um and then the next symptom was unstable relationships um I found this, I don't know, not as, um, you know, when I've met people on the personality disorder units and their experiences of unstable relationships, I guess it didn't affect me so much or as badly. Um, I did have unstable relationships with family members, friends, um, in like romantic relationships. And I would just think the world of someone at one point and then I hated them and I didn't want to see them again. And a lot of it was to do with sort of feeling like misunderstood, feeling judged, just like my support system not really understanding what was going on because I couldn't explain it to people. I couldn't tell people sort of how I was feeling and get it out there so they understood what was going through my head when I would overdose. Uh, why I was self-harming, why I would ask for help one minute and refuse at the next. So it did affect my relationships with people. Um, now that I am in recovery, I feel like I've got more stable relationships with my friends. Um, my relationship with my mum is absolutely amazing and I appreciate sort of everything she's done for me. And if she was to make a decision to sort of get me help when I was saying I didn't want it, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't hate her for it anymore, which is, I mean, I didn't hate her, but you know, it was kind of like, I'd be angry with her because I'd be like, you know, I'm putting we both through all this by overdosing and then you're helping to save my life and just putting me through even more. That was sort of how I saw it on my darkest days. Um, but now I know that on my good days I want to be alive and so if people can help me get through them bad days by forcing me to have help in any way then thank you to them basically. Um, the next one is suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, I think this was probably the first obvious symptom I had. Um, I did sort of start self-harming when I was about 15 or 16, which is when I was going through my trauma um, and I would just scratch my arms um, 
Sometimes it was literally just like a little raised red scratch. Sometimes I drew blood. Um, but it was never anything sort of significant, I guess. Like after seeing people's self-harm now, I wouldn't say it was too bad. I mean, any kind of self-harm isn't right and you need to get help for it, but there were scratches. And then in 2009, I took my first overdose. Um, and it just, I think people assume that when you say you've took an overdose, they, they just think immediately that you were trying to kill yourself. And for me, that wasn't always the case. I think that overdosing became my way of self-harming. Um, I did cut as well. Um, but it was mainly overdosing. That was how I would tell people how I felt. Um, in a way, that was how I would get help. You know, if I was really, really struggling, then if I overdosed, people would say that I was struggling. And... I would get some help for that um, and as well you know there's a lot of reasons why people self-harm I mean I was sort of really angry at times and I actually found that if I was cutting if I didn't think about anything in particular and I cut then it was like a scratch it was like a little cut um, if I totally thought about my trauma and the person involved in it I could end up needing steri strips and I have never gone beyond needing steri strips I've never needed stitches or surgery or internal stitches anything like that the worst has been steri strips um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have scars I have scars sort of from my elbow down my arm I've got some on my hand and I've got some on my thighs as well and you know I'll look at them these days and I'll think what did I do why you know I've got these scars now and what if I never get rid of them what if they're sort of are still a bit obvious and I never feel too comfortable um I've always had this thing about what if I need sleeves on my wedding dress um and it's something you know, um, self-harming by cutting is something that can leave a longer physical effect on you, I think. Um, I mean, some of the girls, the scars in the hospital were just, like, they would never go, no matter how much bio oil they used, they, they were never going to go. Um, so I guess I have been lucky for how small mine are and that I do have a chance of getting rid of them um, but then in a way I kind of saw overdosing as like shorter term and I know it was really dangerous for my physical health and my liver and things but once it's done and you're safe physically and there's no damage to your liver that's kind of it physically Whereas, like I said, you're left with scars for like the rest of your life usually. Um, and I think the self-harming and overdosing um, reduced when I sort of decided that I didn't want to die anymore. I didn't want to hurt myself. Um, I also developed like a massive fear of a and and things. Um, you know, before I went into hospital, I'd be attending a &E's maybe like three times a week, two for overdose and one for cutting or something. And it just became my life. It didn't be, it wasn't a big deal for me to go to a &E. And it, it shouldn't be like that because, you know, it's for emergencies. And yes, I was poorly and I did need the medical attention, but it shouldn't have become a routine in my life. And it did. And now that it isn't anymore, I absolutely hate having to go to hospital for anything. Um, you know, when I do have medical things wrong with me, I'll put off going to hospital. And it's something I've got to work on.
but in, in a good way it is a massive motivation for me not to self-harm or overdose because I just don't want to be in hospital, I don't want to go through a and &E. I don't want to be sat in a hospital bed and not have my kitten and all my home around me. Um, so I think that's been the main way how I've managed to um, ease that symptom of BPD. The next symptom is dissociative symptoms. Um, for me this presented as, at first, um, auditory hallucinations, so I heard voices in my head. Um, it started off with just one voice and I think it got to about four or five and each one had like a different personality and a different name um, and it was just so hard because they with I felt like they all had these personalities so there would be one that would be really angry um, and if one was louder than the others then I felt like I adopted their attitudes and outlooks so then I'd be really angry and aggressive there'd be one that was like more suicidal and that was when I would be overdosing all the time there was one who was more childish and excitable so I would be like that some of the time um it did develop into um visual hallucinations the um main ones I had were rabbits um, which don't have a massive significance in my life. I mean, it's not like I've had a particular trauma with rabbits. I did have some when I was little and they had babies and they killed their babies. But other than that, I'm not too sure sort of why it was rabbits. Um, I did start having tactile hallucinations, which means um, that you feel something that's not there. That was really scary because there was a rabbit there and I thought everyone says it's an hallucination so I'll walk straight through it and I tripped and I felt the rabbit's fur on my foot and you know I said to the staff you've lied it's not a hallucination I've just felt it and then I was told well now you're experiencing tactile hallucinations um, to start having hallucinations of any kind it makes you question everything you know, if I heard someone scream right now, I'd think, was that in my head? Was that next door? Do I need to be worried? And that happens because I've heard things that no one else could hear. Um, if I say something a little strange, like there's a, um, a meat place near my home and every so often they have someone dressed up as a cow or a pig and they dance on the side of the road. When I first saw that, I was like, oh my god, I'm really poorly now. Um, so yeah, just things that are sort of out of place or a bit strange, you'll question them once you start having hallucinations. Um, my To improve those that symptom, um, I've had antipsychotic medications. I've been put on a lot of different ones and a lot of different doses and eventually well eventually they did find a right one but it actually gave me pancreatitis so that didn't last long and then I was put on quetiapine which I'd been on at the start of my hospital admission but I was on a really low dose and I ended up on almost the maximum dose for a year or so um, and that helped my hallucinations to the point where I haven't had a hallucination for five, six months maybe. Um, and I've actually, I'm reducing my antipsychotic medication and coming off of it. So that's kind of a massive achievement as well in my recovery. Um, so yeah, I think medication did play a massive part in reducing my hallucinations. Also with my diagnosis they say that the hallucinations are kind of caused by the trauma and stress related so having therapy about my trauma and managing my stress and low moods better um, probably did have an impact overall on my hallucinations. Um, the next symptom 
is about a sense of self. Um, the, I mean, let's say like a disturbance in identity or something. For me, I found that if somebody asked, you know, what kind of person I am, I couldn't answer them. Um, and it wasn't about a shy thing or like not being confident or not knowing my strengths. I just, I literally didn't know and I felt like different people saw different sides to me. There'd be the friends who I could be honest with and I could tell them how bad I was feeling. There was the friends that I would just stay on nights out and have drinks with and fun and positive stuff. Um, I mean, I guess living with my mum at the time, she probably saw so many different sides to me. Um, so that was how I experienced that symptom. And a massive way that this has improved has been through my blog. Um, because it's helped me learn who I am, it's helped me to learn what I enjoy doing, what I would like to do as a career, what I'm passionate about. and you know that's taken maybe three years for me to learn who I am but still if you ask me I'd be like um, I'm a blogger and I love social media and I'm passionate about mental health I could answer the question now there'd probably still be some uncertainty but I could give you an answer so that's an improvement Um, the next one is I've just um got some notes here <laughs> that's why I keep looking down um, the next one is recklessness and impulsiveness. Um, I think the biggest thing I was impulsive about was spending money. And I went and got an overdraft. And I've never been out of the overdraft since I got it, which is probably four years or something. And it's so hard to get out of it now and I'm paying a ridiculous amount for being in it now and I do regret ever getting it but what can I do about it? It happened, I've done it and I need to work on it and get out of it. Um, a massive sort of thing that's helped me to rein in my impulse of spending has been having responsibilities now so I haven't to pay my bills having to buy all my food shopping, having to look after my kitten, pay our vet bills, buy her food and litter and toys and buy furniture and everything. Like that's helped me rein in my spending. And I do budget a lot better. And as soon as I get paid, the first thing that comes out of it is my savings for my bills. And then, you know, I'll budget what I've got left and if I've got any events to attend and train tickets to buy then I'll budget money for them so that if I am going to have a little shopping trip I know how much I can spend and it doesn't leave me penniless by like the next time my money is due. Um, next, chronic feelings of emptiness. Um, it's another symptom that I think people have had worse experience of than I have. Um, my sort of biggest thing with this was sort of trying to fill myself up in a way with different things. Um, I don't know, just feeling like a piece of me was missing. And I think that's also come with learning who I am and the type of person I am and what I enjoy. Um, but yeah, I know people can have it a lot worse than I did. Um, and I think feeling empty is a hard feeling. It's sort of on the lines of feeling numb, I think. So you're, you become quite determined to get rid of that feeling in any way and you will try so many different methods to get rid of that feeling um, in the same way that you would feel a numb. Um, but yeah, again, it has improved with me finding out it, what type of person I am and making peace with other issues I've had in my life, um, with my dad 
and with the trauma um, and that's improved and having a better relationship with my mum and with my friends and having my little kitten Dolly like that fills me up with love and pride and how could I ever feel empty when I've got a little responsibility running around my sitting room acting crazy and I say that but she's actually like curled up asleep on her bed right now <laughs> but she does do that um, next fear of abandonment um, I think this begun when my mum and dad split up which I'm probably not going to talk about because I just I don't really see the relevance and I don't see why people need to know something about need to know about that um, but it was that symptom for me was made worse by professionals because there were so many times that I was met by a negative attitude from professionals um, you know being called attention seeker just being told we're not you know if you're gonna refuse treatment we don't care just go home and see if it kills you basically um, you know police making horrible comments I was called a selfish cow by a police officer asked why I liked detention so much until she found out I had an actual diagnosis and then she apologised and it was just so confusing because then you would meet a professional who would go to any lengths to make sure that you didn't die and it you just didn't know where you stood well I didn't um, and that was a massive feeling of abandonment for me and the way that feeling has improved has been from being in a hospital for two and a half years where the staff didn't give up no matter how hard I pushed and tried to make them they didn't and you know right from the start of my admission I said to them you're gonna give up on me you're gonna realize you can't make me better and you're gonna let me go home and I am gonna kill myself and they said right from the beginning we're not you're gonna get better here and that's what happened so you know I mean a massive thank you to the few professionals at that hospital who didn't give up on me and who were there from the start to finish um, a massive person for that is the doctor that I had um, I probably mention her quite a lot in blog posts and things because she was my biggest support in that hospital and she was absolutely amazing and she is probably the best example for me of a professional not giving up on me um, because I pushed her so far and tested her so many times to see if she would and she didn't, not once um, finally, irrational anger um, I have had bouts of anger that make me ashamed of how I reacted to them um, I have been aggressive towards staff, medical staff, psychiatric staff, police, paramedics. I have been aggressive and some of it, yeah, is anger that's irrational and can't be controlled. And then some of it was just, you know, not wanting to be alive and they're trying to save you. Um, a few times staff have made comments which have made me angry um, and yeah I'd say that I've done some things I'm ashamed of when I've been angry um, but I've learnt from it and I once attacked a member of staff because of something she said I literally jumped on her and was punching and kicking her and I was put in seclusion and I've never done that again because I learnt from it and it didn't help me in any way and it just meant I got kept in hospital for longer and was in a room all by myself for a few hours and then had to be given an injection to sedate me it wouldn't happen again and I think the biggest thing with recovery is to learn from 
some of your actions and feelings and not not regret them and not think I don't know I mean it's it's normal to wish that you maybe hadn't done something but I think as long as you learn from it that helps your feeling of regret because it makes me think well you know I do better now it's not gonna happen again so in a way it has a positive effect um as well medication did help with anger um sometimes as well I would find that my anger was um <laughs> bit of fluff just flew at me um a lot of time my anger was directed at the wrong people and it was based on things that weren't relevant um I don't know, say something happened at the time, I would relate it back to something that had happened during my trauma. And I would, so then my anger was irrational because it didn't match the situation. It wasn't controllable. Um, and at them times medication helped, you know, um, mild sedatives and things. Um, and I do still have them as medications I can take if it gets bad. Um, and I've also learned to control my anger, I think. Um, sometimes I just realise sort of what's the point in shouting and screaming and kicking and hitting and stressing myself out and making me look like a bad person some situations just aren't worth it and I can recognise that now. Um, so I guess as an end little thing, um, I just wanted to say that if people are watching this and they have BPD and they're sitting there thinking that's not how I get them symptoms or that's not how I feel at them times or that's not why I do what I do. Everyone is different just because you have the same diagnosis. It, it doesn't mean you've got anything in common whatsoever. You know, like I've said, people can experience different hallucinations. They can self-harm in different ways. And you know, the feelings of abandonment and emptiness and stuff, they affect it some of the girls I met in hospital massively, a lot more than they've affected me. Um, so yeah, like that needs to be taken into account if people are watching this and they just think that's not the way I feel. Um, because I realise that the way others feel, it's not the way I feel either. Um, so yeah, I guess like the symptoms, they're not necessarily the same and they don't affect people as much as they might affect others. Um, I also want people to see from this video that everyone has the potential to recover. No matter how sad, how lost, how lonely you feel, you've got the potential. And I don't want to be like, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But I can only tell you is how bad I felt in the past, how low I felt, how lonely I felt, how suicidal I felt, and I came through it. So please don't lose hope and please don't lose hope because everyone has the potential to recover from any kind of mental health diagnosis. Um, and finally, don't be afraid to ask for help. If you, like I said at the beginning, you know, if if you're watching this and you think, I feel like that sometimes, or yeah, if you watch and you think, I felt like that and I haven't spoken to anyone about it, then speak to somebody because you never know. And things like this, it's good to nip stuff in the bud. If I'd sought proper help as soon as I started scratching my arms, like how different might things have been? If I told someone as soon as I started hearing voices, would I have ended up overdosing? Um, so yeah, please don't be afraid to ask for help um, or to seek help yourself. 
because it can help or it can make you worse and either way give it a go at the end of the day because what have you got to lose if you're feeling that awful what have you got to lose just give other people a chance as well as giving yourself a chance um so yeah i hope this video was like informative and interesting maybe i don't know can't imagine my life's that interesting although I vlog a lot so I must think on some degree I hope it's been informative and interesting and might help people to have a better insight into things I say in my blogs things that I do in my vlogs um, the way that I am the kind of person I am I hope that gives people a better understanding and like I said at the beginning, if you've got any ideas for things you would like me to sit and talk about, then leave them below. Um, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. And check out my blog as well. And all the links to my social media accounts will be below. So thank you guys for watching. And I'll see you soon.